In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank You for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. And uh, this is where we left off Thursday and then... Uh, I kind of missed something on the latter part of verse 19 that we'll get to now. So 16:19. Now this is where it says, "I'll give I I will give y'all." That's in the plural, and for us Southerners, it'd be y'all. I will give y'all, except for Judas Iscariot, of course, who is an unbeliever, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And the keys of the kingdom of heaven are, of course, the prerogative of witnessing. And all of us have the keys, and we can offer the keys to any unbeliever who seeks them and simply give the gospel to the unbeliever, and that is the keys. We have them, and we have the ability to give them to the unbeliever uh, through uh, to telling them that it's faith alone in Christ alone. And we also took a look at John 20:22. 20, and the reason we did this is because it's a parallel of this passage. And in John 20:22 20, it says this, and, we, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now remember, in context, this is still the age of Israel. Uh, technically, it's the hypostatic union, union, of course, but everyone's still functioning as if they lived in the age of Israel. And so what this was, uh, what occurred here in John 20:22, 20, is not the filling of God the Holy Spirit. It is the endowment of God the Holy Spirit. And so that's because we're still dealing technically with the age of Israel. And so they received the endowment, but in this case the purpose was uh, different than it had been in the past. When King, King David received the endowment of the Spirit, it was used so that he could rule Israel. And when uh, people like Saul, of course, he also was a ruler, and uh, others. Uh, some were endued with the Spirit, uh, such as Noah, to build the ark. There was no way Noah could have built the ark for that great storm that was going to come. No way, except for uh, the endowment of God the Holy Spirit. And it was the endowment of God the Holy Spirit that allowed him to make such a perfect boat to withstand all of that water. And it did. New Orleans won't, but to Noah will. And then uh, we have the fact that uh, he goes on and says, You declare the gospel. Well, the endowment of the Spirit was given to them at this point uh, so that they would understand the gospel and be able to declare it. But even at that, our Lord uh, forbids them for, for, from doing so until after the church age. So really the endowment here had to deal with uh, their understanding. It was given to the, the, the disciples because they were having an awfully hard time understanding the doctrines that our Lord was giving to them. So he went ahead and breathed on them the endowment so that they could uh, maybe understand some of these things a little better. They are remitted. You declare the Gospels, what it says, and they are remitted. And that means that they can have a response to the Gospel. And then it says, and whoever sins, we went over this, that's why I'm going over it quickly, and whoever sins, that is, they've rejected the gospel, you retain, that is, they've retained uh, sin, they're never going to be without sin, and they will uh, be condemned, not on the basis of sin, but on the basis of their rejection of Jesus Christ. So what, what is actually being said here is you can say to them that their sins are remitted if they believe in Christ. That's your key. And if you witness to someone and they tell you, yes, I believe that, I believe in Christ, you have the right as uh, owning the keys to say, well, you're saved. And that is often what we do. And not only do we do that, but most of the time we should make clear that not only are they saved for believing in Christ, but they'll never lose that salvation. 
and make that clear to them as well because that is the, the second most basic thing to understand. Then continuing with 19, this is the part I missed on Thursday, uh, they that will witness have the keys. Whatever you bind, and that means they are binding those decisions made for Christ. And that binding actually refers to permanence or something that is permanent, meaning uh, eternal security. And we're in Matthew uh, 16, 19. Matthew chapter 16, 19. They that will witness have the keys. Whatever you bind, that is decision made for Christ, is binding and permanent. On the earth will have been bound in heaven. And that is with permanent results. And this is what this binding means. It's all permanent. And with permanent results, meaning eternal security, of course. And it's all found here, especially in the original languages. Uh, but this is also dealing with eternal security. And whatever you release on earth will have been released from heaven. And of course that is if they reject it, uh, they have the keys. As it were, if somebody says, I reject what you're saying, they can say, well, you're going to hell for doing so. And it might sound harsh, but it's exactly true. And Jesus Christ has not only given the disciples these keys, but... He's given us as church age believers the keys as well. That's why we're commanded to witness. And there's an excellent book on witnessing over there somewhere. I hope it's over there. And uh, it deals with how to witness and uh, what to focus on. And you focus on the gospel, of course. Then in 1620, Then he commanded his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. And this is because our Lord had to present himself to Israel first. This is stated all throughout Romans that the Jews received it first, then the Gentiles. And they did. And the Jews were to receive it first. That was the protocol of the age because Christ had to offer this to Israel first. And if they would have accepted it, in fact, if the Israelites would have said, I believe in Christ, I accept His uh, post-millennial doctrines, if they would have said that, then Israel would have continued as a client nation. But they didn't accept that, and therefore they uh, fell as a client no nation in August of 70 A.D. And we too, because of our attitude toward Christ, mostly because of believers' attitude toward doctrine, are facing a similar situation in which religion is prevalent, but uh, doctrine is not. Not in this country anymore. It's mostly a bunch of religious, religious hogwash out there today. And for that reason, uh, pretty soon about 25% of our oils are going to be cut off. I looked this up on Fox News today uh, to look at the where do we receive 25% of our oil? The Gulf of Mexico. What's occurring there now? A hurricane. And they predict that by Monday or Tuesday, uh, oil prices per barrel will go up over $70. That will uh, translate to over three bucks a gallon for us pitiful souls in South Carolina. For those in California, over five bucks a gallon, probably. And uh, if it keeps going that well, we're doing all right economically now, but if it keeps going that way, well, people have to start to making lifestyle changes. And not only that, everything you buy at Walmart goes up in price. Anything you buy is going to start going up in price when oil goes up in price because it has to be shipped by truck or plane. or All these things use fuel. It's a necessary commodity. And because we don't fight wars correctly, and because we haven't already taken over Middle Eastern oil, we've got problems. And because of do-gooders, like environmentalists, and we'll have big problems from that as well. Remember uh, that uh, human good is the worst enemy to freedom. Human good goes around, oh, we can't drill in Alaska, we'll kill the poor deer. A human good, which is it's a false premise anyway. Building an oil rig or whatever to dig into Alaska doesn't mean deer will drop dead. If anything, they might uh, picket humans' food around the area and be fed. I know when I went to West Virginia one time on an anniversary, uh, there were deer everywhere. Everywhere there were deer. Why? Uh, not, because, not for any other reason than because humans were feeding them, myself included. Almost got the thing in the hotel room. I wasn't going to because if you get a deer in a hotel room and they freak, it's over. And the, the place is destroyed and then I would have to pay for it. Uh, but uh, we kept them right outside the door and just fed them some cheeses. 
And why were the deer, and you weren't supposed to, well, I rebounded, but why were the deer there? <laughs> well, they were there because humans were there. And I'm not going to get off on all that political uh, junk, but it's just true that human, human good, human good uh, is a destructor of freedom. And all this environmental stuff is human good. And uh, the, the very people who are whining about high ga- gas prices are the very people who put restrictions on oil companies. And they're a bunch of hypocrites, but uh, so is everyone else. And then including ourselves, really, and we'll get to this in a minute. Now we go to 1621, and this is Jesus' first prediction of his death and resurrection. And this is a basic doctrine. Jesus' first prediction of his death and resurrection. And we know about Jesus' death, and we know about Jesus' resurrection. And we know that it is a basic doctrine, something that all of us should understand. We should understand that Jesus Christ went to the cross and died as a substitute for us, and all of our sins were imputed to him and judged on the cross. And then after three days, he rose from the grave. Something he's going to tell the disciples, something he's going to keep on telling the disciples, and yet they don't get it. They don't understand this basic doctrine. They don't have a clue about it. They don't even understand the purpose for Jesus' life on the earth. They know he's their Savior. They know that, and they're saved. But they don't understand how he's going to provide salvation. They don't understand they don't understand the most basic of things and they've been with our Lord for now uh, going on up to 2 years by this point and they don't have a clue. Then in 1621 it says from that point of time and from that point of time refers to the point of time in which our Lord gave a pro- prophecy of the church in which things are going to be radically different than they have ever been before. And we've heard all of these things, that the church is radically different than the age of Israel, radically different than the age of Israel that will continue in the tribulation, radically different than the millennium. And not only radically different, but far better. What we have is the greatest ever, greater than what they had in the Old Testament. And we might go back and read about the great stories of David and say, my, how I wish I was David. Do you know you have more than David? Or you might go back and read about Moses and admire him, and he uh, deserves admiring. He was a great believer. But you have more than Moses, and Moses yearned to see this day. So we've been given 39 irrevocable absolutes, plus one, which is the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And we've been given so many wonderful things that I've uh, given to you in the past. I won't go over them again, but uh, what he is prophesying is something new, the church. And they don't have enough doctrine to recognize it. And uh, the reason, another reason why our Lord is telling them uh, He breathed on them the Holy Spirit in John 20, 22, but the reason why He's not telling He's telling them, no, don't go out and talk about Me right now, is they don't even have enough doctrine to do it. They don't even know that our Lord has to go to the cross. Now, how is anyone going to be able to witness not knowing that the Lord has to go to the cross? Nobody. I mean, you would be giving such confused messages. In fact, you would end up like Pharisees saying, believe and do this. Believe and be baptized. And they would get all confused. And that's why Christianity is confused today. Because most people, uh, what has happened is a lot of people have gotten saved and went gung-ho. And it's understandable. They know they're saved and they get all excited and they want to run around and tell the whole world about Christ. But they don't know enough to do it. And so out of this has come a tremendous amount of false doctrine, a tremendous amount of screwed up ideas. And uh, what has happened, there's a lot of pastors out there who are nothing more than a baby believer still excited about their salvation. They believed in Christ, got so excited about it, and they might not even have the gift, but they have the gift of gab. So they get up and they talk about Christ everywhere, but they don't even give it straight. And then they end up in a pulpit and they're giving this the blind, leading the blind. And even though they're saved, they're leading a whole bunch of other people astray, not intentionally. I don't say they do it intentionally. Some of them are very sincere. And when they say, invite Christ into your heart, they are as sincere as I would be when I say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They're just ignorant. But sincerity isn't worth anything. You can be sincere and completely stupid, and you're mixed up, and you're going to mix everyone else up who comes in contact with you. And it's, uh, you have to know something before you teach something. And that's a principle, one that is ignored today. Now, if you were going to a doctor, of course, you want to see that plaque where they went to school. And you want to know how they studied real hard so that they know how to deal with your health. 
But for some reason in Christianity, when it comes to pastor teachers, as long as he just makes you feel good or whatever, then there's no real uh, need to uh, wonder about what he knows. And, and that's really stupid because this is the most important thing in your life. Now we have Jesus' first prediction, and he's teaching them, and he began to clearly, this is the corrected translation, from that point of time on, Jesus began to clearly reveal to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and experts in the law, and receive death. Now, I don't know what your uh, translation says, but this says receive death. And he must receive spiritual death. And this is passive, meaning he's going to do it of his own uh, free will and it's going to happen. Now, uh, of course, The Passion of the Christ, it's a, it's a good movie, but it focuses on the physical death of the cross. And I recognize some people could be saved watching The Passion of the Christ because they had a lot of good... Uh, well, they showed John 3.16. They showed a lot of passages from Isaiah. Uh, some of the things that somebody could watch that, he, read those passages and say, I believe that. Uh, but what they focused on was the spiritual death, and that's the best Hollywood could come up with. And Well, that's because, or the physical death, sorry. And uh, then uh, when they focus on, they could not focus on the spiritual death. Do you know why? It was invisible. What happened at the spiritual death? Well, the earth went black, and Jesus Christ became the invisible hero. That's why our hero ship as well is invisible, and it's just uh, showing something. We follow the prototype in the form of the protocol, so ours too is invisible. So three hours of darkness fell upon the entire earth. No one saw the suffering and the pain of our Lord. They heard him scream out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, but they did not see the pain. So that would be a pretty boring film to watch the spiritual death because we can't understand it and we can't see it. So if the focus would have been the spiritual death, which is the reason why we have salvation, the only thing they would have shown in The Passion of Christ for three hours was a black screen with him screaming, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And most people would have walked out bored by the end of it. And so they showed the physical part, the stuff we can see. And uh, But the, the real impact, the reason why we are saved, is the spiritual death. And that is unseen, of course, but we know about it, and that is uh, what the disciples do not understand. They just don't under, They know they're saved by grace. They know they sa they're saved by Jesus Christ. They don't understand how. And that's why there's so much false doctrine today. Most people don't understand how. They'll focus on the, the physical death. And the physical death was unique in itself because our Lord was unique in humanity, but the spiritual death is what saves. And the physical death is enough to make you get choked up watching that movie and even a walk away from the theater crying just knowing the magnitude of the physical suffering our Lord went through on our behalf. But the spiritual suffering was a hundred times more intense. So if you understand the spiritual suffering, you might have went away a crying a hundred times more than somebody who didn't understand it. Because it, it, I'm not saying it's a bad film. I'm just saying they uh, focused on that which is not that uh, is not the most important part of it. And on the third day be raised. And by the way, the power of Christ, which raised the power of God, the Holy Spirit, which raised Christ from the dead, is available to each one of us. Not, not, uh, not as in right now we could resurrect ourselves, but God the Holy Spirit is going to resurrect us at the point just as He resurrected Christ. You see, what I'm trying to say to you is we're following in the same footsteps as Christ. Christ was buried and went three days and was resurrected. Guess what? We're going to be resurrected. The prototype, our Lord, was resurrected. The power of God the Holy Spirit resurrected Him. We will be resurrected. And if we were to all die tonight, and then the resurrection occurred uh, ten years from now, ten years from now, the power of God the Holy Spirit would resurrect us. Or if the resurrection were to occur in five minutes, we would all be resurrected uh, by the power of God the Holy Spirit, the same power available to Christ. And that's phenomenal because uh, what this shows us is that the same power of our spiritual life is available to us. only thing we have to do is learn it and apply it. That's it. And it's all a grace system. 
And once you get once you get to spiritual self esteem and start growing in grace and in knowledge, it no longer becomes a point of competition. And we'll see all kinds of stuff from Matthew. Uh, people getting competitive with each other. We'll see that from the disciples. And they get jealous of Peter and then get competitive with each other. And that's not what it's about. It's not about human competition. It's about simply living your own spiritual life as before the Lord. And you'll grow up spiritually. Some grow faster than others, some slower. And, and some are more positive, some aren't. But uh, it, it all depends on your volition, really. And it's not how you were born. It's just uh, how much interest do you have in it. And that's your own personal choice. Then we have in... Uh, after 1620, he tells them, don't tell anything, don't say a word to anybody. And then we have the uh, prediction of the resurrection. And the fact, and what we're going to see now is uh, Peter. And Peter, uh, after such a success, which we studied, he had a short-lived success in which he said, uh, you are the Son of God. You are Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And uh, so our Lord uh, gave a little compliment to Peter where he talked about how now uh, you have the keys of the kingdom of heaven and he really uh, got a fat head now. And that's what happened to Peter. He, d he didn't have spiritual self-esteem. And what happens to people without spiritual self-esteem when they receive any type of compliment, it stimulates their ego or their human self-esteem. So Peter here has a lot of human self-esteem, and I know this because uh, guess what? Uh, what you should be noticing uh, from Matthew so far is that every time a disciple opens his mouth, which one is doing it? Peter. He has a superabundance of uh, human self-esteem. Well, he'll, he's, he's a loud mouth. He'll just talk all the time. And uh, he would probably be a very likable person to be around. It wasn't that he was mean or cruel. Uh, he just uh, thought a lot of himself, a whole lot. And psychologists would get a hold of Peter and say, that man is the most well-adjusted man I've ever met. Well, he'll just socialize with anybody. And he's just going out conquering the world, even though he's an idiot. But they'll say that because he has great human self-esteem. But all that uh, boils down to something called arrogance. And we'll see what arrogance does to Peter. And uh, Peter is the first one to always uh, uh, pipe up and say something. He's the one always, he's almost like the spokesman of the disciples' group. He should have let our Lord be the spokesman, but uh, every now and then he got ahead of himself, way too far ahead of himself, and he wanted to be the spokesman. He wanted to be the one to get up and int introduce the Lord and all that. And he, he did have a lot of leadership qualities as a man, uh, but uh, it, he was ruining himself with arrogance, and a lot of us do the same thing with arrogance. It's something we all have to grow out of because we all are prone to it. Now, uh, when we are born, we have nothing but a sin nature, and that sin nature is prone completely to arrogance, absolutely and completely prone to arrogance because our father at that point, which would be Satan, uh, being that we're under the sin nature, uh, that was his inclination, arrogance. Then in 1622, so Peter, ad now this is what it really means. Now, I should, have, I should have gotten the other translation so I could compare and contrast, but I just have it straight from the Greek here. So Peter admitted him into his society. That's what it actually means. Uh, it means that, um, and then it says, and began to mildly rebuke him. Now, he had just, he's, not, he's been chewed out by the Lord enough that he's not going to uh, rebuke him harshly, he's going to try a different tact. In other words, what he's doing, this is what he's doing, he's trying to act like uh, he's doing the Lord a favor. You see, what the Lord just did is said, uh, you know what, disciples, I'm going to have to go to the cross, and I'm going to have to die, and I'm going to be re resurrected in three days. And that disturbed Peter, and it was sincere. He doesn't want to see the Lord die. And so what he does is, as it were, admits him into a society by uh, probably wrapping his arm around him, bringing him close and saying, uh, Lord, uh, God help you. Now this is funny here. This is what he says to him. God help you, Lord. This must not happen. Now none of you laughed, and that's because you don't understand the meaning of Lord. Lord always refer refers to deity. It's, it's Peter recognizing him as God. So what he's saying is, God help you, God. It's really showing his ignorance and his complete and total arrogance. 
Imagine going up to the Lord. God help you, God. This must not happen. Well, he, he's mildly doing it and he's sincere about it, but the sincerity is worthless, especially when coupled with ignorance. Now, if you know a lot and are sincere, well, that might be worth something. But sincerity in itself, you can be completely ignorant and you can be very emotional and be very sincere. I mean, the Pentecostals are sincere about what they do when they're running up and down aisles. They think they're doing the right thing. They're very sincere. They think they're serving the Lord, but they're so far out of line. It's just ignorance coupled with sincerity. And this is what was wrong with Peter. Very sincere, but very, very ignorant. So he began to mildly rebuke him, saying, God help you, God. This must not happen. And then, uh, So what happens here? We get some points because uh, Peter is uh, bringing our Lord into his society, and this indicates he's trying to run the show. And so point one, the key to this whole verse is the fact that uh, Peter, in the past, as we studied, had his ears tickled by the Lord. And it wasn't our Lord's intention to... Uh, make uh, Peter get a fat head. But he was going to compliment him when he needed complimenting. You see, our Lord probably figured after he chewed him out so much, it's about time for a compliment. And once he said one thing right, just one, everything, every other time he's been saying everything wrong. Every time he goes up to the Lord, Peter's been wrong, way out of line. Human viewpoint. And so every time our Lord's had to rebuke him. And our Lord probably got sick of rebuking Peter so many times. And then when Peter says one thing right, his eyes light up and says, uh, uh, thank you, Peter, and gives him a compliment and all that and tells him that uh, he's going to have the keys, etc., etc. And Peter takes it so personally that he gets a problem with arrogance. So his ears were tickled. And now he feels like he is the special spokesperson and that uh, he is someone who can actually instruct the Lord and admit the Lord into his society. And it, it is a complete uh, arrogance, really. And uh, it's not a, a mean type. We might think of arrogance as people being mean. And if someone is mean to us, we might say, that person is completely arrogant. And it, it's just a reaction, sometimes normal, most of the time from the old sin nature. And we might have a boss. And the boss gets on to us for something, and maybe we need it to be gotten on to. But when the boss does it, who is in authority, we might say to ourselves, oh, that guy's just arrogant. He's abusing his power, uh, chewing me out that way. Nobody talks to me that way. And, uh, and that is the way uh, most people think of arrogance. They uh, assume it on the wrong person or push it on the wrong person, like they did with Moses. Moses was never arrogant. Oh, he was, he, had, he was loud mouth. He had to be. He had two million people to instruct. So he was loud when he got up and he spoke. And he chewed them out and called them rebellious several times. One time he got out of line. He got so upset. But the, the point is that uh, that's not arrogance. Just because you're being forceful doesn't mean you're arrogant. In fact, Peter, who is not forceful, he's, he's a timid little mouse right now. He gets forceful later in life. But right now, he's a timid little mouth, and he wants to follow the Pharisees, and he wants to get along with everybody. He's like Rodney King. Why can't we all get along? And that's exactly his standpoint and his viewpoint. And so he's trying to bring the Lord into his society, saying, Lord, uh, don't think about these things, about dying and such. Let's just all get along, and it's all going to be all right. Trying to instruct the Lord, complete arrogance. And so point two was uh, Peter, by admitting the Lord into his own society, shows great and tremendous arrogance. Point three, and what he's saying, in other words, Lord, now that you've seen that I'm a great man, now that you have uh, finally come around and noticed that I'm awesome, as I always knew that I was, and now you've confirmed it, it's time that uh, you come into my society and understand what I'm trying to tell you. And so uh, Peter had a long way to go. He was, he was sincere, uh, but it's all coming from his arrogance, a natural predilection for Peter. And then up uh, point four. Peter elevates himself to our Lord's level of authority. This is actually what he does because he speaks to the Lord as his equal. When he comes up to the Lord and uh, mildly rebukes him, you see, when you bring somebody into your society, what are you doing? You're treating them as an equal. Now, when you go to college, or if you go to college, 
and uh, you might want to join a fraternity or a sorority or whatever you want to do. And if you go and join one, guess what? Uh, when you join it, first you've got to go through a ritual, a rite of passage, and then you become an equal. Before that, you're not. And this is the way Peter is thinking here from the Greek. He's thinking, well, now that the Lord has made His rites of passage by recognizing me as so great, I am going to admit Him into my society and I'm going to tell Him like it is and show Him that all of this stuff He's talking about doesn't have to be. And you say to yourself, but He's talking to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, He is. He's talking to a God incarnate. But it's not going to be the last time Peter's going to do this. And he's going to do it even many years after this when he's going to try to instruct the Lord that uh, people can't eat pork, etc. They must follow this, the certain eating, the, the eating code that they had in Israel. And if you eat pork, you're out of line. And the Lord's going to tell him, that, no, everything is available to eat now. We're in a different age. And he's going to argue with the Lord and then he's going to lower the boom on him again. But he finally learns. He's arrogant, but he's not the kind of person who, who won't listen. There are some people who are so arrogant and, and they'll never listen to anybody. They'll just uh, go out on their own, and they're right all the time. They're always right. And nobody can say anything to them or they get offended. Well, that's the hypersensitive type of arrogance. Peter definitely wasn't that hypersensitive because he sticks around the Lord. And the thing, maybe he's too stupid to be hypersensitive from what I'm seeing from Peter. He just seems to be uh, so gung-ho that uh, whatever the Lord says, it's almost like... Well, uh, you ladies might not understand it, but I as a man understand it. If you ever work in a, a type of uh, situation like in a machine shop, ladies will never understand it unless they have worked there and they still don't like it, and I don't blame them. But if you work in a machine shop or if you work in construction, you're going to get around a bunch of men, and what do men do? Uh, they like to act tough. And uh, they will throw around cuss. They'll razz each other. It's part of culture. And uh, they might not take it too seriously. Make fun of somebody because they're bald. Make, son of, make fun of somebody because they got a funny looking nose. And they'll kid each other about this with cuss words and all that. Now, if ladies, if you ladies were to go into the office and uh, another lady came up to you and not, not in gossip, but just, uh, hey, uh, uh, you gained, looks like you gained 20 pounds today. Oh, well, guess the ladies will get mad, hypersensitive. But the men, you walk in and say, hey, fat tubbo, how you doing? Uh, usually he's just a big jolly fellow and I'm doing good. It's all a part of normal protocol. And they go to work and they razz each other. And uh, Peter is like this. He, he gets razzed by the Lord. He's probably been razzed his whole life and he probably razzes other people too. And if you go up north, that's a big part of culture, not here in the south. It's hard for us to understand. In the south, uh, we're more um, the gossip type. We're not going to go up to your face and make fun of you. We'll do it behind your back. And then when you walk in, we'll just uh, uh, talk to you just as nicely as we've talked to everyone else. And uh, some of you laugh because you know it's true. Uh, but up north, but up north, well... If, if, if uh, you have some type of thing that makes you stand out differently, if you're overweight, if you're too tall, if you're too short, then they're going to make fun of you and razz you. And they're not doing it necessarily to be very harmful. But if you're from the South and you go up North, you're going to get your feelings all bent out of shape. I guarantee it. I, I, I know you will. Uh, you, you wouldn't be able to handle it. And they always razz you. I remember when I was going through my teen years and I went up north to visit uh, my cousins. And, you know, the teen years, it's the time when uh, things start to change. And they looked at me and said, boy, you got hit by the ugly stick. <laughs> well, uh, but they don't think anything of saying stuff like that. But if you say that down here, well, people get hypersensitive about it. It's part of culture, and it's also part of why things are so phony in churches today. You know, sometimes you have to bring it down to what it says in the Scripture. And the, what I'm getting from all this is that the culture of Israel is much like the culture of the Northeast today. They, they razzed each other all the time. And so when Peter would say something to... Uh, when Jesus would say something to Peter like, uh, you knucklehead, well, it was just like common everyday talk. And he didn't take it too seriously. But he should have took it more seriously. And he should have, he should have but he didn't. He said, okay, I'm a knucklehead today. I'll be better tomorrow and I'll show you. And he does. And then he gets all arrogant about it. And this is what happens. 
and and so what actually he what he's moving into blasphemy right here, and it's almost I almost don't even want to teach it about Peter because we're going to see a comparison and contrast. We're going to see Peter now, and then we're going to look in Second Peter when Peter's about to die, and you're going to see a totally different person. I mean, it'll show you what doctrine can do with a man, and you would never think Peter would make it. If I were standing around looking at Peter, I would probably be so judgmental of Peter, I'd probably say, this fool's never going to make it in life. He'll never be a winner believer. And uh, Peter would have surpassed me by far. All of us by far. Believe me. Uh, Peter went the full route of his spiritual life. Not as far as Paul, but he went as far as his volition would take him. So when Peter did this, so Peter admitted him into his society and mildly rebuked him, saying, God help you, God, this must not happen. And then what happens in 1623, your Bibles might say, but he turned, but actually this is a pretty intense. It says, but he whirled, our Lord whirled around. And this one, and most of the other insults didn't phase Peter so much. This one's really going to phase him. And another one's really going to phase him even more than this. But he whirled and said to Peter, Go away, Satan! And your Bibles might say, Get behind me. It simply means, Go away, Satan! Now imagine, you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are following the Lord, and uh, suddenly you say something stupid, and he turns around and calls you Satan. None of the disciples have ever been called Satan. In fact, Jesus has never called anyone Satan except Peter and Satan himself. So here's Peter being called Satan. You can imagine the shocked look on his face. You can imagine the uh, butterflies in his stomach or the churning in his stomach. Uh, if he had a lot of sense, he'd probably about be wanting to vomit by now. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ just called him Satan. And uh, being as stupid and ignorant as Peter is at this point... You might even start to wonder about your eternal security. But what's he mean, I'm Satan? Satan's going to hell. Am I going to hell? And that you know that's exactly the way he was probably thinking. And then he said, and that's after he told him he had the keys. And so and then he says, you are a stumbling block. And that's It's a noun. You might have it as a verb. I don't know what they would put it, but it's a noun in the Greek. So you are a stumbling block to me. The reason why is because uh, Peter is ignorant of divine viewpoint. He has human viewpoint. And what would be the human viewpoint? It would be natural for any of us. We have a good friend. We've been hanging around constantly day after day, night after night. You know, they've been together now for approximately two years. And uh, they haven't uh, been separated except once. And uh, uh, pretty much they, uh, well, the, Peter would consider the Lord a good friend of his. And so now the good friend of his is saying, get away, Satan. And uh, he's, he's saying, you don't have divine viewpoint. And it would be natural for us if we have a, a good friend who says, you know, it's not going to be long before I'm going to die and be resurrected. And they might be ill or something. And you would say to them, naturally, having human compassion and human viewpoint, you would say, oh, no, you're going to be around 15 more years. Don't you worry about it. And uh, and the fact is, uh, this is Peter was... Peter was humanizing our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ had a plan to follow. Peter was humanizing our Lord just as many people humanize the Lord today. Now, he did have humanity, but it was perfect humanity. That was coupled with his deity that were separated, of course, but together in one, meaning hypostatic union. And so, uh, he was humanizing him. He forgot... It's as if he forgot who the Lord was, who he was all about, what he was about to do. And he really didn't know what he was about to do. And he couldn't understand what he was about to do. Everything for him was human viewpoint. And human viewpoint doesn't carry you. It's, it's, a, it's having the viewpoint of doctrine that carries you. And the same thing holds true for many believers today. They humanize God. Or they try to humanize Jesus as well. And remember, we're, we're not even to pray to Jesus. Jesus prays for us. And a lot of people today will say, Oh dear Jesus, help me. We've studied how to pray. We pray to God the Father in the filling of God the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, but you don't pray directly to Jesus Christ. And when times get hard, you don't say, Oh dear Jesus, help me. But a lot of people do that, and that's part of their humanization, really, because they're using Jesus. They don't even say Jesus Christ. And it's a technical point, but the fact that they are humanizing our Lord by doing that as if uh, our Lord is their best friend. Now, He is phileo, and He does love us, 
And uh, in that manner, he is our best friend, but uh, he's our best friend with authority. I guess you could put it that way. Uh, but they're trying to dictate to the Lord. And none of us ever should dictate to the Lord. And when someone in our family dies that's close to us, oftentimes we want to dictate to the Lord and say, why did you do this? You should have let that person stay on. They had a purpose, etc. Or you might have some type of emotional reaction and just uh, fall all apart. And we've all probably done it. I know I've done that not in death, but in other things. You just fall apart and say, oh, hi, God, why are you doing this? Well, when you fall apart like that, you're humanizing God. And you're instructing God. Now, I'm not telling you this as someone who has never done it before. I'm sure we've all done it. We all have sin natures. If Peter's done it, we've definitely done it. And we just want to know why things don't go better. Why, God? Well, we're trying to instruct him. And he, he, he probably would say to us, you have 39 irrevocable things, two power options, three spiritual skills, uh, ten problem-solving devices, four spiritual mechanics. What else do you need from me? In other words, you're insulting him. Uh, give me more, give me more. Well, that's our nature, our sin nature, and it happens. So what Peter has is definitely an absence of doctrine in the stream of consciousness, and that will destroy anyone uh, from understanding uh, the divine viewpoint. That's why Peter only understands the human viewpoint. Now in 1624 he says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever desires to follow me, disregard self. That's the actual translation. Whoever desires to follow me, disregard self. Yours might say deny self. That's pretty close. And pick up his cross and follow me. Now, what does this all mean? Now, a lot of people have taken uh, pick up the cross literally. But remember, uh, the cross of our Lord hasn't even happened. He hasn't even described his manner of death just yet although it's been revealed in the Old Testament. And uh, this isn't talking about the cross of Calvary. We can't pick up the cross of Calvary. It's impossible. To do so is ignorance. There's no way we can pick up the Calvary, uh, the, cross, the, ca the, cross of, the cross of Calvary. And then he says, and follow me. So let's get down to what this means. Then Jesus said to his disciple, whoever desires to follow me, disregard self. Now, this is starting out talking about uh, the fact of uh, human volition and faith alone and Christ alone. It's an expression of positive volition. And so, uh, whoever desires to follow me disregards self. What do you do when you believe in Christ? <coughs> well, you know, this is why it's so hard for many people to ever come to faith alone in Christ alone. Because when you make that choice to believe in Christ, you are disregarding yourself. Once and for all, uh, for at least that one moment, you might go back to yourself later, but if for that moment you've disregarded yourself, and you, you might not understand what I'm saying, well, guess what? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves. You've disregarded yourself. And that not of yourselves. And uh, etc. And that is, uh, the, the fact is, that we don't work for it. We have to put away all human good. And that's hard for, it's very hard for Jews to do, very hard for Muslims to do, very hard for anyone steeped in religion to do, because they've been trying to get to heaven by their own works, by themselves. Muslims don't believe in Christ. How are they getting to heaven? By themselves. Flying planes into buildings, I'll go to heaven if I fly a plane into a building. Or I'll go to heaven if I follow the Mosaic Law. Or I'll go to heaven if I don't kill cows. That's the Hindu. Or I'll go to heaven if I do this and that and the other. And they're depending on themselves. When you believe in Christ, you've disregarded yourself, your own human power, and all human good. You've had faith alone in Christ alone, and you've added nothing to it. And if you say, I believed in Christ, but I also was baptized, you are including yourself into it. You're saying, I believed in Christ, but I also was baptized and my head was dunked under water, and that's why I'm saved. And when you say that, you are not disregarding yourself, and you are not saved. When you're saved, you disregard self, and you believe in Christ, and that's the moment of salvation. So whoever desires to follow me, disregard self. The desiring to follow him is an expression of positive volition, an expression of wanting to be saved. And then disregard self, 
is a rejection of human good. Isaiah 64, 6, uh, all righteous deeds are counted as filthy rags in God's sight. And that is what exactly, that's exactly what it means. And pick up his cross. First part of this verse deals with salvation. Second part, it, it, it separates from salvation and now it deals with the unique spiritual life after salvation. And pick up his cross. Utilization of the protocol spiritual life. Our Lord lived the prototype. He's passed to us the protocol spiritual life. Therefore, the only way you can follow the Lord as a believer is to follow the unique spiritual life and utilize all the things that I've been teaching you. It's execution of their very own protocol spiritual life. So the first half deals with the unbeliever. What should they do? They should believe in Christ. And by doing so, they've disregarded themselves. And then what should you do after salvation? Pick up your cross. What is your cross? Your protocol spiritual life. It's not heavy, it's light, as our Lord explains to us later. Uh, you can uh, think of it as a, a lightweight uh, plastic cross. It's something that's not hard for us whatsoever. And it's not uh, uh, referring to the agony of the cross. And this doesn't mean we agonize. And it doesn't mean we give up the things we enjoy in life. It doesn't mean we give up uh, bowling because somebody else told, told you it was a sin. And I've had somebody tell me that before. I went bowling, and they've said, uh, do you know those people smoke in those bowling alleys? And I want to say, do you know I do? But I didn't say that. <laughs> but do you know those people uh, smoke in those bowling alleys, and uh, they drink beer, etc.? I said, yeah, but what if you're just going to bowl? Oh, no, you're exposing yourself to sinners, as if they weren't. But that is people who have not disregarded self. These people are so full of themselves, thinking they're getting to heaven by how they act and who and what they are. They've never disregarded self. And some of these people aren't saved. And I guarantee you, I have relatives whom I love very much whom I know are not saved. And you probably do too. And uh, though they think they are because they uh, do all these good things or because they follow all these moral codes. And hopefully by the grace of God, they receive salvation at a younger age before they got sucked into the cosmic system. And uh, in a lot of cases, that's the case. But once they go so far off the deep end, it's hard to tell. I mean, you can't tell an unbeliever from a believer once you go so deep into the cosmic system. And that goes for the antinomian as well as the legalist. There's a lady last night came knocked on our door, and I felt pretty compassionate for her. She was obviously hopped up on crack or addicted to it, and, and, and she needed a ride. And so uh, I gave, we, me and my wife gave her a ride back to her town, wherever it was down the street, and uh, obviously she was probably a, I don't know, probably a prostitute selling herself, and she said, now pray for me, etc. And uh, you, you kind of want to have uh, feel some compassion for people like that, I, at least I did. And uh, you just wonder, you know, maybe they should get on the right track. But, the, but then I started thinking about it, and I thought that, uh, you know what, I have more, co I should have, I should have, I don't, but I should have more compassion on those Pentecostal nuts running up and down aisles. Because even though she was hopped up on dope, you could talk to her and she made a little sense. But when you get in a group of Pentecostals and they're hopped up on emotion running up and down the aisles, they make no sense. I mean, do you follow? This woman is in antinomianism, but she's acting better than a Pentecostal. It's true. If you think, and it's nothing spiritual about acting that crazy. That's insanity running up and down aisles, flopping at the mouth, just as I just did, and just rolling around and all of that. For It's, it's stupid. It's just, it just shows an emotional revolt of the soul. And people uh, like her, who was on crack, well, she was better off than these Pentecostals. So shouldn't I have more compassion for them? Well, it's hard for me to do. I don't, I don't have compassion. They should know better. Uh, but uh, for this reason... Many uh, sincere uh, do-gooders often aid uh, Satan's cause. And uh, where that point came from, it, it seems to be uh, ad hominem. So, then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever desires to follow me, disregard self, expression of positive volition, and pick up the cross and follow me. Then in 1625, For whoever desires to save his soul, this is through salvation. For whoever desires to save his soul, and they desire that through positive volition, and they want to hear the gospel. We'll lose it. What's that mean? You want to save your soul, now you're going to lose it? 
Now, if we were just looking at this in the English, we'd be all confused. Yeah, I want to lose, I want to uh, win my soul to cry. I want I want to be saved, but uh, then I'm going to uh, lose it. This means that you're going to live your protocol spiritual life, and uh, this means you don't live as unto yourself, but you live uh, the unique spiritual life unto God, and and so you lose your life. And what is that life? It's really a pathetic one. When you're an unbeliever, what's your life? Your life is a life of carnality. When you believe in Christ, you are designed to have a life in the unique spiritual life and to be under the power of the filling of God the Holy Spirit. That is your, that's how you're designed. Now, there are some who uh, would rather continue under carnality. And they are acting just like unbelievers, and they're acting as if they've not lost it. That is, the they haven't lost that old lifestyle of being in carnality all the time. Now, we're all going to go into carnality, uh, but when you are positive toward the Word, you'll be filled with God the Holy Spirit and grow in grace and in knowledge. So, for whoever desires to save his soul, and that means they've had, they, they're going to receive salvation... We'll lose it. That is referring to after salvation when you are to live your unique spiritual life, your protocol spiritual life. And when you live your protocol spiritual life, you've lost that old way. And the old way is the old sin nature. But whoever loses his soul, now we have uh, something different. But whoever loses his soul, this is legalism on the basis of human good. Totally different subject. And you see how English is so lacking. And we'll get back to this verse so I can explain it more thoroughly, thoroughly in, the next, uh, 40, or in the next 15 minutes. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we can grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.